All right, good evening. I'm going to start here, so if you could make your way to your seat, that'd be great. All right, I want to say good evening and welcome. My name is Dave Swearingen, and I'm on staff at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC. Also with FERC, we have here tonight Lauren O'Donnell and Michael Boyle. To my left is Bill Flanders with the U.S. Department of Transportation's Pipeline and Hazardous Materials and Safety Administration, or FEMSA. To my far left is a court reporter. This meeting is being transcribed so that the public record will reflect the comments that are, that are uh, submitted tonight. At the sign-in table when you came in, we have representatives of Argonne National Labs. Argonne is assisting us uh, in our environmental review in the preparation of the environmental document. Um, there we have John Crummel and Rob McWhorter and Connie Westcott. So let the record show that the Anchorage scoping meeting began at 7.05 p.m. February 13, 2012. The purpose of this meeting is to give you the opportunity to provide environmental comments specifically on the Alaska Pipeline Project. The Alaska Pipeline Project is being advanced jointly by TransCanada Alaska Company and ExxonMobil Alaska, which I will sometimes refer to as the project proponents or the applicant. TransCanada and ExxonMobil jointly entered into the FERC pre-filing process on May 1st, 2009, through which we began our review of the facilities that we refer to as the Alaska Pipeline Project. The FERC is being assisted in its environmental review by, by like I said, our contractor, Argonne National Labs, but also several cooperating agencies, namely the Office of the Federal Coordinator, or OFC, and we have Frank Richards with the OFC is here with us tonight, the U.S. Bureau of Land Management, or BLM. We have Earl Williams, who is the Alaska Gas Line Project Manager, representing the BLM, is in the audience tonight. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Mike Hawley, with the Corps of Engineers, is here with us tonight. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. As I mentioned, the U.S. Department of Transportation Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, or FEMSA, U.S. Geological Survey, the U.S. Coast Guard, Allison Air Force Base, and the Alaska State Pipeline Coordinator's Office. The project would involve construction and operation of a new pipeline system to transport up to 4.5 billion cubic feet per day of natural gas from Point Thompson to Prudhoe Bay and then down to the Alaska-Yukon border. At the border, the pipeline would then interconnect into a new pipeline system in Canada to deliver to North American markets in the lower 48. There would also be a number of compressor stations, in-state delivery points, and various other facilities. The project also consists of associated infrastructure such as access roads, helipads, contractor yards, pipe storage yards, construction camps, borrow sites, and dock modifications and dredging at Prudhoe Bay. In a little while, I'll ask a representative from TransCanada to take the floor to present a more detailed project description. They'll be able to answer some of your questions regarding the project, and be able to, you'll be able to ask them questions after the formal part of the meeting is over. They've set up a table in the back with maps and such. Right now I'm going to talk a little bit about the FERC scoping process and public involvement in the project. The main FERC docket number for the Alaska Pipeline Project is PF0911, it's PF09-11. The PF means that we are in the pre-filing stage of the process. Once the proponents file a formal application, a new docket number will be assigned. The National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, requires that the FERC Commission take into consideration the environmental impacts associated with new natural gas facilities. 
Scoping is the general term that we use for soliciting input from the public, agencies, Native American groups, landowners, and other interested stakeholders before the environmental analysis is conducted. The idea is to get information from the public and these other stakeholders and interested groups so that we can then focus our environmental analysis on the issues that are most important to you. The scoping period started last August when we issued our notice of intent to prepare an environmental impact statement, or NOI. In that NOI, we described the environmental review process, some already identified environmental issues, and the steps that the FERC and the cooperating agencies will take to prepare an environmental impact statement, or EIS. We have set an ending date of February 27th, 2012 for this scoping period. However, the end of this scoping period is not the end of public involvement. Once the draft EIS is issued, there will be a comment period open for comments on the draft EIS and additional public meetings. An important step in the environmental review process and the preparation of an EIS is to determine which environmental is resource issues are most important to you. Your comments and concerns, along with those received from agencies and other parties that may, we may have received already, or that we may receive between now and the end of the scoping period, will be added to the public record as issues that we will address in the draft environmental impact statement. Last month, the project proponents filed draft resource reports, which begin to describe the resource impacts and that will be um, affected by the project. So uh, those are on the public file and you can comment on them as well. Because the project sponsors are still preparing their FERC application, they're still developing it. As I said, we're in the pre-filing process on the formal application has not yet been filed. So because of that, your comments tonight, or in those that you may file uh, or have already filed, all these comments will help the companies address the issues and potential effects. After receiving a complete application, FERC staff will prepare our independent analysis along with the cooperating agencies of the project's potential impacts. And this is what will be published in the draft environmental impact statement. The draft EIS will be mailed out to all the people that are on the mailing list for the project. If you're not sure if you're on the mailing list, then you can add your name to the back. If you got a copy of the NOI, then you're, all, then you're already on the mailing list. But if you um, did not get a copy and you heard about this through the community and you want to be on the mailing list, be sure and sign, sign that paper at the sign-in table. Once the draft EIS is published, we will continue our environmental analysis addressing the comments and the new, in whatever new information comes in, and then we will publish a final environmental impact statement. Now, our mailing list for this project is well over 2,000 people, organizations, and agencies. So what we're going to do is the default method of mailing for the, the, the draft and final EIS will be a CD. If you prefer to have a hard copy, that's fine. There's a couple ways to tell us that you would prefer to have a hard copy, but you need to tell us. The NOI had a checkbox that said that you would prefer to have a hard copy, so you can mail that back in. If you're sitting there thinking, well, you know, I don't know if I did that or I don't have my copy anymore, you can tell us at the sign-in table. Just make a check that says that you would prefer to have a hard copy. If you don't let us know, when you go to your mailbox, there'll be a CD sitting there. Now, I need to differentiate between the role of FERC staff, which I represent, and that of the FERC Commission. The Commission is responsible for making a determination on whether to issue a Natural Gas Act Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity to the project sponsors. That is, the Commission will decide whether or not to approve this project. The EIS prepared by the FERC environmental staff and the cooperating agencies does not make that decision. The EIS is not a decision-making document. What the EIS does is it discloses to the public the impacts of the project and it, makes, it allows our commission to take into account 
those particular environmental impacts as well as in, in the condition that we'll take into consideration non-environmental impacts as well. So the EIS will describe the project facilities, the associated environmental impact, alternatives to the proposal, and staff's conclusions and recommendations. As I said, the, the FERC Commission then will take that information as well as non-environmental information such as markets, tariffs, rates, design and cost, and certain engineering aspects and tariffs in making an informed decision on whether or not to approve the project. Now this particular project is unique in that it was addressed by Congress in the Alaska Natural Gas Pipeline Act of 2004, or ANCPA. The objective of that act was to facilitate the timely development of an Alaska natural gas transportation project to bring Alaskan natural gas to markets in both Alaska and the lower 48 states. That legislation designates the FERC as the lead federal agency for the purposes of complying with NEPA and specifies that all federal agencies that have a permitting role in the project use this single EIS to meet their required environmental reviews. So that is an overview of the FERC process of how we develop an EIS and how we go about scoping. In a few minutes, I'll ask an, a couple other people to, to take the floor and talk about their respective roles. But before we do that, are there any questions about the purpose of this meeting or what I've described so far? Okay, with that, I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Bill Flanders with FEMSA, and he'll talk about his agency's responsibilities and oversight. Hello, everybody hear me? Good, I'm the uh, Alaska uh, Community Assistance Technical Service Representative for the Office of Pipeline Safety. Now the Office of Pipeline Safety is a branch of PHMSA. I'd like to thank FERC for inviting PHMSA's Office of Pipeline Safety to this scoping session. When Alaska Pipeline Project receives permit approval from FERC, to the, for the construction of the pipeline, PHMSA will maintain regulatory oversight over the construction and operation of the pipeline. During the design and construction aspect of the projects, PHMSA will ensure the following, that the design is in accordance with the federal regulations 49 CFR 192 for natural gas pipelines, constructed of suitable material for operating environment and installation stresses that the pipeline will encounter. Welded and non-destructively tested in accordance with industry and federal standards, and that will require 100% of the welds to be inspected. Installed to a proper depth and backfilled with suitable material, hydrostatically tested after installation to one point two five times their maximum operating pressure. Mainline valves to have line break closure system or be able to manually close within one hour. Once the pipeline is placed in service, FEMSA will inspect periodically covering all aspects regulated under 49 CFR 192 regarding operations and maintenance of the pipeline and any special permits that may be associated with the project. The operator must establish comprehensive written procedures describing types and frequency of operational activities to ensure the continued safe operation of the pipeline. FEMSA will audit the operator's compliance to his procedures and to the code, and code requirements, including the following. After the pipeline is placed in service, that a curvature deformation type inline inspection tool will be ran within six months. And this type of inline inspection tool will find out for uh, dents and for uh, settlement areas or frost heave areas. Adequacy of their external corrosion prevention system. This is typically called a CP system or cathodic protection the operability of pipeline valves and pressure control equipment, patrolling the right-of-way, 
leak detection surveys along the pipeline, control room management procedures for operating the pipeline, training of operating personnel, and integrity management of the pipeline. If you have any questions on pipeline safety that are not addressed in this meeting, I will remain here for a period of time after the meeting to allow you to the opportunity to ask the questions or pick up my card. I have an office here in Anchorage and you're welcome to send me an email or come in and talk to me at any time about any pipelines that uh, you have questions about. And I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, express uh, PHMSA's um, appreciation for coming and explaining the, our responsibilities to this meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bill. Uh, next on our agenda here, uh, we are fortunate to have uh, Kurt Gibson, who is the director of the Alaska Gas Pipeline Project Office, and he's gonna say a few words. Thank you, David. My name is Kurt Gibson. I'm the director of the State of Alaska's Gas Pipeline Project Office. That's the office that was created under the Alaska Gas Line Inducement Act, AS4390. We're charged with the responsibility of overseeing <clears throat> application of the state's project capital uh, funding, as well as regulatory streamlining among state uh, regulators, state agencies. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to just briefly add a little bit of clarity to some of the comments and some of the conversation that's been taking here in the state of Alaska in recent months. As recently as October of this year, the governor uh, made some comments at the Alaska Oil and Gas Association luncheon regarding his interest in seeing alignment behind a single project and encouraging the interested commercial parties to align uh, behind a single project, maintain the Alberta option, which is what this project uh, currently, the project configuration currently contemplates is a, a project overland into Alberta, while at the same time uh, investigating whether or not commercialization of Alaska's North Slope gas uh, may better be pursued through a project to Tidewater with liquefied natural gas being shipped overseas markets. Um, the purpose for my comments is to, again, to kind of unpack what the governor said in October and again in January so that people are clear that at no time has the governor ever indicated that he wants this project to be suspended or stalled or work to stop on this project, um, but he also recognizes, as do a number of other folks who have been paying close attention to this, that markets are dynamic and conditions change in ways that oftentimes require us to reevaluate what is the best way to commercialize North Slope gas. So the governor was clear when he said he would like the interested stakeholders, the major North Slope producers, and this project team, the APP, under the framework of the Alaska Gas Line Inducement Act to preserve the Alberta overland option while at the same time investigating the likelihood of an LNG project to, to Tidewater, a Tidewater location as yet undetermined. Um, that's the extent of my comments and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Kurt. I uh, appreciate you dropping by for that. Um, is there any questions, Kurt, are there any questions for, for Kurt before we uh, move on? Okay, he'll, uh, he'll stick around after the meeting for a little bit if you think of something you want to ask. Um, so again, we want to thank uh, Mr. Gibson for doing that. Okay, next, we're gonna have um, Mel Johnson, representing TransCanada, come up and give a brief overview of the Alaska Pipeline Project. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, my name is Mel Johnson. I'm the uh, Director of Pipeline and Facilities for the Alaska Pipeline Project. And uh, we would also like to thank uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission for having us along uh, for this scoping meeting. And uh, my role will be to present an overview of our project um, as we've outlined in our uh, resource reports, our draft resource reports that we filed. I'll be using a uh, PowerPoint presentation, which is, which is up here. And if anyone did not pick up a paper copy, there are some copies at the back table if you wanted to uh, follow along that way. 
Um, it was also mentioned, Dave also mentioned that we do have a table in the back with a number of maps and, and more information on the, uh, some of the specifics with regards to the project here in Alaska and the location of the, uh, the project. And we have a number of team members here as well that will be available afterwards uh, if you, if you want to follow up with any of the questions, or if you have any follow-up questions. Uh, so just initially, uh, really what I'm going to speak to is information contained in our draft resource report number one, which is a general overview of the project. Um, and already uh, Dave pretty much outlined the roles of the various uh, uh, regulators involved with the project, so I won't, uh, I won't go over that again as well. So I'll just move right along. The project itself, um, this is an overview and, and on the presentation you can see a, a map. And the map shows the entire project, uh, which includes a, a line from Point Thompson gas fields uh, that connects Point Thompson gas to Prudhoe Bay. And then the uh, pipeline in Alaska from Prudhoe Bay down to the Canadian border, which pretty much follows uh, a, a, a built up corridor already with highways uh, connecting to uh, facilities in Canada uh, that then new facilities that would be built from the border uh, with the Yukon in Alaska down to connect with existing pipe facilities uh, in Canada, in Alberta. We call this the Alberta option uh, because that's the, uh, the really the connect point uh, for this. And then further, the gas is moved from Alberta to all markets in, uh, in the lower 48, if you will, in North America. Um, part of the facilities, and I'll go through them with a bit more detail, includes the gas treatment plant up at Prudhoe Bay. And, uh, and then there are also uh, five takeoff points, uh, a minimum of five points to deliver gas to Alaskans in, in Alaska. Uh, there's a note uh, on this PowerPoint uh, on, at the bottom which talks about the number of acres that would be affected by the project and you'll see that it says 32,000 acres during construction and just a little over 10,000 in operations during construction and Dave mentioned there are a number of temporary uses of land for storage of pipe for example, storage of materials and then for the construction along the right of way we require uh, a wider right-of-way during construction and then when we move into operations we only we only require a certain portion of that right-of-way so it'd be a, a, a little over 10,000 acres. Just to uh, narrow in on the specifics the uh, Point Thompson pipeline is a uh, approximately 58 miles of 32 inch pipe the wall thickness is just a bit under half an inch uh, the pipe would be built to transport approximately 1.1 billion standard cubic feet per day and, uh, and at a pressure of about 1130 pounds uh, per square inch. We, uh, we also would, it would receive the gas and it would be cooled uh, below freezing before it enters the pipeline. On this piece of pipe, the gas would move really from Point Thompson to Prudhoe Bay uh, with the pressure that it's delivered at, and then there'd be, there'd be some pressure loss along the pipe, but we don't require additional compression facilities for, for this pipeline, uh, for the Point Thompson uh, gas pipeline. The gas treatment plant up at Prudhoe Bay is, uh, is pictured here, you can see in, in the uh, graphic. Uh, the, the parts of the graphic that are outlined in yellow uh, represent existing facilities. Uh, the orange uh, representation would be new facilities built for the project and then some of the red which includes really the road up to the west dock and then some of the west dock portions uh, of a project that exist today but for use for the project. The uh, gas treatment plant would be built to process approximately 5.3 billion standard cubic feet of natural gas. So we'd have a Point Thompson gas and, and what currently uh, is, is available uh, at, at uh, Prudhoe Bay and essentially would remove the CO2 and hydrogen sulfide 
and uh, also compress and chill the gas and then put, deliver about 4.5 billion standard cubic feet to the pipeline, which again would be transported down. Uh, the pipeline, uh, which I'll get to in a, in a minute, uh, would be operated at a pressure, a maximum operating pressure of 2,500 pounds per square inch. Uh, at Prudhoe Bay, as part of the gas treatment plant, there'd be about approximately 1 million installed horsepower and that's for the, uh, both for the uh, parts of a plant that would be removing the, um, the CO2 and, and the H2S, but it's also for generating the power that's required for the gas treatment plant, as well as the compression uh, for the pipeline gas, and then also the compression facilities that would be as part of this facility to re-inject the, uh, the CO2 and, and gas back into the, uh, into the field. Uh, part of the infrastructure upgrades, as I just touched on a little bit, is uh, with the West Dock, uh, there would be a certain amount of work, some dredging uh, and, and whatnot, that would allow us to transport the larger modules uh, into, uh, into the Prudhoe Bay area. This slide really just uh, depicts the, a, a photo of the current facilities uh, up at Prudhoe Bay, and then a graphic of the facilities that would be used for the gas treatment plant. The Alaska Main Line um, then would be approximately 745 miles of 48-inch pipe. Uh, the wall thickness for this pipe would be just under one inch, and again, delivering at a pressure of, uh, of 2,500 pounds. Uh, the natural gas would be cooled again. Most of the pipe would be buried. There are a couple of above ground installations and requirements, but most of the pipe would be buried and, and the gas is cooled uh, in, in order to minimize impact uh, to, to the permafrost and, and allow for operations. Um, the other above ground facilities that would, we would have would be meter stations to measure the gas. And then we've got major block valves along the pipeline. Uh, we've got pig launchers and receivers. So uh, Dave in his introduction uh, and, and as well uh, from the FIMSA perspective talked about the maintenance that would uh, be carried on for the pipeline. And that's why we require launchers and receivers to, uh, to provide the maintenance capability for the, for the pipeline. And then I also mentioned the uh, minimum five offtakes within Alaska. The compressor stations I talked about would be located approximately every 90 to 100 miles along the pipe, and, and that's really just to maintain the pressure profile to keep the gas moving uh, al along the pipeline. There'd be a design, uh, we, we've designed for eight compressor stations uh, along the way, and again, that's to uh, to move the gas along and then also to cool the discharge gas. Um, each station would require about 25 acres per site. And if you look at the graphics again, the, the lower graphic is an existing compressor station that we have on our Alberta system right now that's, that's in operation and gives you an idea of the size. And then the top graphic again is a depiction of what the compression facilities for this um, pipeline would, would be. Uh, essentially, most of the stations would be single unit, and by that we use uh, aeroderivative gas turbines uh, to provide the horsepower, and they, they basically turn compressors to compress the gas. Uh, there are about 45,000 horsepower turbines that are, that are installed, and uh, most of the facilities would have one uh, turbine, uh, although we do have two stations with more than one, and that's for the reliability of the system and, and to get the compression that we need. Uh, the other on-site facilities w uh, would include power generation uh, for the facility, again, using natural gas as the fuel. These compressor stations are designed for remote operations, but we also have living quarters uh, built in at each site uh, for, for maintenance. The project schedule, I think most of you have seen this before, and, and uh, really what I'd draw your attention to is that we, of course, as has been mentioned, we're in the pre-filing process. Uh, our intention and our commitment under AGEA 
is to file the resource reports and, and the application for the CPCN in October of this year. And then there's a period of time where the draft uh, environmental impact statement is derived as well as a final environmental impact statement. And so we would look at approvals sometime in, in 2014. The schedule beyond that, and it's in a, a different uh, color, really is um, a function of the commercial support from the shippers uh, for the project and then the project sanction from the project sponsors. So that's sort of what lies ahead of us. That really is uh, the end of the uh, presentation. It's meant to be a quick overview. Again, uh, what I would draw your attention to is we do have our uh, address there for our website for the project, and as well as uh, it was described how you can uh, access the docket from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, to get information about the project. Our website also provides numerous links that will take you to the same uh, draft resource reports as well as provide informative uh, updates on the project and what's happening. So that's, that concludes my remarks for uh, this evening. Okay, thank, thank you, Mel. Um, before we move on to the environmental comments, are there any questions about the project design or the description that Mel just, just, just presented? Okay, uh, as I said before, um, Representatives of the project proponent, they'll, they'll be in the back with their maps and such. So if you want to go um, after the formal part of the meeting is over, um, go talk with them. Uh, feel free to do that. Now, right now we're going to move into the part of the meeting that is kind of the, uh, the main purpose of the meeting, and that's to hear uh, whatever environmental comments that you may have that you want to let us know so that we can focus our environmental analysis in the EIS. Now, I want to say that, that if you... Um, want to speak tonight, that's great. We have a couple of people who have signed up. After um, we have these people uh, present their comments, I'll open the floor for other people as well. If you would rather write down your comments, we have uh, comment sheets where you can write the comments down and, and leave them with us tonight. Uh, there's also the option to mail them into FERC or to use the electronic filing system. And there's a, a handout in the back that describes that, and it was also described in the NOI. It doesn't make any difference to me how you get the comments to me, whether you want to speak tonight. Uh, so don't feel like if you're on your way home and you think, oh man, I have this great comment, that it's not too late. You just send that to us and we'll give that the same amount of consideration as if you would have spoken in here tonight. Um, just a couple of ground rules. As, as I said before, we have a, a court reporter here. So for your comments, I'll need you to come up to the, the podium. That way the, the, the transcript will, be, will, be, will, be, will reflect exactly what it is that you, that you want to say. I'd ask that when you come up that you state your name and you also spell it for the record. And if you are representing an organization or an affiliation of some sort, that you also uh, give that information as well. The first person that we have um, who signed up to speak is uh, Robert Breen. Thanks. Good evening. My last name is spelled B-R-E-A-N. My name is Robert Breen. I'm here uh, in a couple of different capacities. First, I'm a tribal member of the Tanacross Village Tribe. Um, I'm also the president of Tanacross Incorporated, which is the village corporation in the Upper Tanana region. And then finally, I'm the general manager of an organization called Dene LLC, which is a limited liability corporation that is made up of Dot Lake Native Corporation, Tanacross Incorporated, Tetlin Native Corporation, and Northway Natives Inc., which is the corporation, a village corporation in Northway. Um, my comments are going to really be addressed to the, um, uh, the eastern part of the project in the Upper Tanana region, uh, specifically and then some comments uh, on the um, uh, resource reports that have been filed. Uh, generally, just a little background information, the 
Diné LLC represents approximately 120 miles of right-of-way uh, from uh, the western perimeter of uh, Dot Lake Natives to the eastern perimeter of Northway, Northway uh, Native Corporation uh, near the Canadian border. So we have a, a bit of a, a vested interest in, in the project. Um, Firstly, I'd like to talk about the, um, the reports uh, that have been filed and, and get on the record with regard to some comments uh, from uh, the group in the Upper Tanana representing those four entities. Section 2 of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act states that Congress finds and declares that the settlement should be accomplished rapidly with certainty in conformity with the real economic and social needs of natives without litigation, with a maximum participation by natives in decisions affecting their rights and property. ANCSA was later supplemented by the Alaska Natural, National Interest Lands Conservation Act, Section 3028B of the Act, provides that the Tetlin National Wildlife Refuge was created for the purposes of the opportunity for continued subsistence use by local residents, among others. The people of the Upper Tanana uh, region formed Diné LLC in 2009 for the specific purpose of providing information, administrative, and support service related to the proposed Alaska Natural Gas Pipeline, including negotiating real property transactions on behalf of the company's members and other development possibilities. Diné believes that the best way to mitigate the adverse effects of the gas pipeline development is to preferentially include local labor and encourage local contracting opportunities for activities on their lands. Diné is a strong supporter of the Alaska Pipeline Project, but only if it is done in a way to enhance the social, economic, and political well-being of the people it represents. Diné LLC has been meeting with the Alaska Pipeline Project since 2009. The APP has been invited as a regular participant in those meetings. And Appendix 1N of the Resource Report Summary of Stakeholder Outreach Meeting shows nine separate meetings between May 15, 2010 and May 26, 2011. And in fact, there have been more meetings uh, both before and after those dates. Two themes thread uh, through the APP's brief summary of the concerns raised in those meetings. One is Diné's willingness to discuss access issues, and two, contracting opportunities. We have not found APP's response to the concerns raised in those meetings in the resource reports. We believe that APP should be required to not only note concerns from the communities, but describe how those concerns have been or should be mitigated. In all of these meetings, uh, we didn't hear about any uh, Upper Tanana alternative route. Um, only uh, once did APP invite Diné to discuss the land access issues, and that meeting ended with uh, APP's stated intent to hold a workshop for members of the Diné on contracting and employment opportunities and that workshop has not yet been scheduled. However, I have been in discussion with uh, AP, uh, people from the APP and uh, we're looking forward to scheduling something here in the next couple of weeks. The Denali project readily negotiated a fee to access lands belonging to the Diné and engaged shareholders and tribal members as labor. Diné was told that APP had a company policy prohibiting payment for access to land for survey work prior to construction. Apparently that policy is selective as APP has a reimbursable service agreements with at least state agencies and at least one private conservation group. We have heard from the pipeline, Alaska Pipeline Project Office that such fees are qualified for reimbursement under AGIA. 
Danae asks FERC to ask APP for its, its response to the concerns expressed in community outreach meetings. Specifically, Danae asked APP to explain the reasons it has refused to engage Danae in meaningful discussions on issues of land access in the Upper Tanana region and to include that in the final resource reports. The, another concern is the failure of the resource report number five on socioeconomics to recognize the Upper Tanana as the home of the people with unique culture living in a unique environment. Because the data in resource report five, socioeconomics, is reported on the basis of the Southeast Fairbanks Census District, the effect of construction, operation, and maintenance activities on the people of the Upper Tanana is masked by being included with the more populous Delta Junction, Sulcha, and Fairbanks Southeast Census District. As a matter of environmental justice, Dene requests that the socioeconomic indicators for the Upper Tanana be reported separately. Further work on the socioeconomic effects on the region should be presented. The data presented is essentially a compilation of U.S. Census and other government generated information. For example, uh, sample air quality data is presented in fairly mind numbing detail in Appendix 9A. Uh, surely the effect of construction on the human environment is as important as the effect on air quality. Notably lacking in this resource report is an, any analysis of the data or uh, predictions of change in effect. One of the best sources uh, for information on the effects of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline TAPS system is missing from the reference list. Mim Dixon, an anthropologist with a PhD from Northwestern University, spent two years studying the effects of TAPS in a book called What Happened to Fairbanks, The Effects of the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline on Community of Fairbanks, Alaska, printed in 1978. It offers a comprehensive model for analysis of how a complex society adapts to change in its social complexity. Uh, Dene believes that this report should at least be considered as the model for predicting socioeconomic effects of the gas line. There are also reports from Fairbanks Town and Village Association that are archived at the University of Alaska Fairbanks that also de depict a number of conversations that occurred in the region in 1979 uh, when Northwest Pipeline Company was attempting to build the same project. I think those documents in the archives at, at the university would be of um, help to the process. There are some issues there that haven't changed since 1979. There are other, other items that would need to be updated, but it's a good source of information that hasn't been referenced and we think should be included. The, the reference that you mentioned, can you give me that title again? There are um, uh, socioeconomic impact reports from the Fairbanks Town and Village Association. And the, um, the one you said, that the authors? The, uh, the title of uh, the Mim Dixon book is What Happened to Fairbanks? the effects of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline on the community of Fairbanks. And I, I'll turn these written notes over to you for the record as well. The amount of freight, the expected number of single axle loads going through the Upper Tanana, the number of workers, the staffing for facilities, all this is information that could help predict the effect of the gas line on the Upper Tanana. And let me just preface this conversation at this point about socioeconomic impacts. We can't talk about the environment in the Upper Tanana region without talking about the people who own the land, who have uh, a subsistence culture, subsistence lifestyle. So any uh, use of the resources uh, on the land, animal resources or fishing resources, are directly attached to the environment. For us, it is impossible to have a conversation about the environment without talking about the people. The use of those animal resources have religious and spiritual significance to our people. And uh, again, we, we don't believe we can have a conversation about the environment without talking about the people, the effects of negative socioeconomic impact, and how to mitigate those impacts. The next item of concern for our people is the Tetlin National Wildlife Refuge Land Exchange. 
Again, Section 2 of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act states that Congress finds and declares that the settlement should be accomplished rapidly with certainty in conformity with real economic and social needs of natives without litigation, with maximum participation by natives in decisions affecting their rights and property. ANCSA later supplemented by the Alaska National Interest Land Conservation Act, Section 3028B of the Act provides that the Tetlin National Wildlife Refuge was created for the purpose of, quote, the opportunity for continued subsistence use by local residents, among others. Further, should there be opportunity for profit-making visitor services associated with the refuge, the native people who traditionally use the area, such as Northway Natives, Inc., are afforded the first preference for providing uh, visitor services. It's hard to imagine that anyone failed to understand the critical path needed to connect the Alaska pipeline project to the pipeline easements on the Canadian side until August of 2011. Perhaps they were aware of it before then, but indications don't, uh, don't show that. Please see figure 10.4-1 for your ready reference. Uh, and sh surely uh, APP recognized that the easement across Tetlin National Wildlife Refuge would require uh, an early uh, attention in the process. And by failing to put this issue on the table in a timely fashion, uh, the appearance of urgency has been created and it, it, this urgency was laid solely on the backs of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service personnel. These well-meaning people have taken the path of least resistance to a land exchange that has grave consequences for Northway and other, other native people in the Upper Tanana. It also attempts to circumvent Title 11 of Anilka, which Alaska Native tribes and corporations agreed to abide by. So the significance of this uh, event has the potential to get the attention of every village, tribe, and corporation in the state of Alaska that agreed to an ANILCA process for the processing of lands in our state. Danae requests that the alternative section outlined, uh, uh, outlined the alternative routes for joining the Trans-Canada Pipeline easement. This discussion should include the reason that these alternatives were dismissed and why this alternative was selected. Further, Danae asks that the final report explain why the land exchange is being completed outside the auspices of AGEA. Further, how are national, state, and local interests served by conveying what is arguably the key parcel of land to be acquired for this or any other trans-Canadian pipeline to a national environmental group and a non-revocable easement to a single company. Another item of concern is the um, list of planned developments on Diné Partner Lands in Resource Report 8, the Land Use, Recreation and Aesthetics. Uh, Diné has not had an opportunity to review the location of the pipeline, facilities, material sites and compressor stations against its land title records. Thus, comments on this aspect of the report will be deferred until later, but we plan on submitting more detailed reports before the February 27th date. There are several planned projects in the region that will or could occur within a quarter mile of the pipeline right-of-way. Thus, Table 8.3-1 should be updated to include biofuels energy projects, any proposed hydroelectric projects, a partially completed land conveyance to villagers and trail upgrades for all of the four tribes and corporations. Additions to 8.5.6 Construction and Operation Impacts and Mitigation and Resources Report 8, Section 8.5.6 should be revised and expanded. The report is incorrect that APP will not cross or affect any federal or state designated trails. Easements reserved under the 17B process of ANCSA were designated and are largely managed by the BLM. 17B easements 
require APP to do more than simply taking the time and trouble to restore the trails to their current level of development. These trails have specific widths, purposes, and limitations on use. Restrictions on use should be mapped and made available to contractors as the landowners will hold contractors and subcontractors responsible for violations of their use. Because the data on cultural resources is, in, is not publicly available, it is difficult to assess the accuracy and adequacy. However, there are several natural areas in the Upper Tanana that require consideration. One example is the Pump Station Hill near Toke Junction, uh, milepost 648.5. It has special meaning for the original people in the Upper Tanana. It is also frequented by residents uh, from the area and uh, special mitigation routing measures might be needed to avoid any negative impact in this area, and there are others, including specifically um, uh, items related to the land exchange right at the Canadian border uh, that I mentioned earlier uh, within the Tetlin Wildlife Refuge. The Upper Tanana Route Alternative. As mentioned above, the Upper Tanana Alternative is a complete surprise to Diné and not a welcome one necessarily. The route would neg negatively affect the traditional and current hunting, fishing, and subsistence activities in the Upper Tanana. Issues uh, involving trespass, littering, dumping, theft of resources, and important cultural locations and items. It is hard, if not impossible, to imagine that significant research has gone into this route to make it a viable alternative under existing deadlines. As long as this alternative is on the table, Diné asks that it be given complete environmental and economic review. Uh, Diné uh, would like to see additions to Table 11.4.1-1 High Consequence Areas. There are a couple of locations that are in close proximity to the pipe. Um, to, to our knowledge, uh, uh, for example, one of, the, one of the locations is the intersection near the village of Tanacross on the Alaska Highway, milepost 643.5. We have approximately 20 structures located within fairly close distance. Um, we would think that uh, those should be cited as a, a high consequence area if in the event there was a, an accident uh, relative to a pressurized gas pipeline going through that area. And then finally, uh, we found that the, the filing was very difficult uh, to use. It's a lot of information, uh, uh, lots of data, but uh, we found it difficult to use and, and we would assume that it would be even more difficult for users that are unfamiliar with FERC's numbering system on, on the filings. Even for those well versed in the system, uh, we couldn't uh, predict the contents based on file names, uh, table of contents of each Acrobat file and an index at least by resource report, if not the entire submittal should be included in the final report. And we have some com uh, comments about the layout and, and uh, um, perhaps some suggestions about the, how the layout could accommodate the public review of the documents that have been filed a little better. I do appreciate the, op the, the, the fact that uh, hard copy and uh, CD disks are available of the, of the filing. It certainly helps uh, trying to wade through that, that uh, data. As I said, this is just kind of our first, uh, first take on, on the resource reports and we'll be filing more detailed information before the 27th, representing our position on, on the uh, data that is in those reports. And then finally, I'd like to read into the record um, correspondence recently occurred. This will give you, a, give you an idea for what our perspective is on this project. Diné LLC represents the villages formed under the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act in the Upper Tanana, Dot Lake, Tanacross, Northway, and Tetlin. Together, the villages own over 120 miles of pipeline easement under the current alignment. APP has repeatedly questioned Diné's capacity asked Diné to submit vendor applications and ignored the interests of the people represented by Diné. The first barrier was that APP demanded proof that Diné spoke for the ANCSA corporations in the Upper Tanana region, despite the fact that presidents of those corporations attended all of the meetings of 
and constitute the membership of Diné LLC. APP stated it would be non-responsive until each village corporation provided a signed letter attesting that Diné represented them for discussion purposes. However, providing these written letters did not result in any demonstration that APP was now interested in greater communication or cooperation. APP actions to date indicate a consist consistent lack of interest, lack of respect when dealing with the original peoples of the Upper Tanana region. Some examples are refusing to negotiate in good faith on access to Diné lands by claiming a company policy not to pay for access. Fully knowing that these fees would be ex expenses qualified for reimbursement under the Alaska Gas Line Inducement Act, AGIA, and knowing that similar reimbursable service agreements exist with the State of Alaska and the Conservation Fund. Failing to involve Diné or its members in meaningful discussions on land exchange involving the Tetlin National Wildlife Range, including the opportunity to exchange in holdings in the refuge, identifying Northway Native Village Council as the a possible trustee, and giving the opportunity for a major donation to a nonprofit in the Upper Tanana. Using state money to contra contract with a state agency to fund another state agency to study our people's use of our subsistence resources on our land in our region without offering Diné meaningful participation in that study. Failing to organize the workshop discussed at meetings of September 22nd, which was supposed to occur the end of October of 2011, and focus on meaningful participation in the project by the Alaska Native landowners in the Upper Ten in our region. And I have to say that it, we did get a quick response from APP people, and we're planning to schedule something in the next couple of weeks, and I look forward to that. Awarding numerous contracts to companies from outside the region and state to perform work in the Upper Tanana region during the period of time that Diné LLC consistently engaged APP in dialogue and requested meaningful opportunity to participate. Failing to notify and discuss the Upper Tanana route alternative with Diné despite our invitations to share information, numerous meetings, and attempts to engage APP in me meaningful discussion. Diné wants the Alaska Pipeline project to move forward. It has repeatedly explained this to APP over the last two years or more. <clears throat> that the greatest mitigation for social and economic impacts on the people of the Upper Tanana region is to create wealth and build capacity through local contracts and jobs. Um, there is no form of lo uh, local government out there. It's in the unorganized borough. Um, so building that capacity uh, through local contracts and jobs is significant. Diné LLC represents the people of the Upper Tanana region consisting of both shareholders and tribal members that are one and the same people. Diné LLC has unlimited capacity to perform contracts in, in the same way that any other company does, including ExxonMobil. It will partner with a know-how contractor to perform the work professionally, timely, and efficiently. This position has been stated to APP multiple times over the last two years as reflected in our meeting minutes. Yet we have been told by members of the APP team and most recently on January 14th of 2012 that without identifying our capacity, APP is unable to consider Diné LLC for work on the project. Diné LLC is not just another contractor. Its members are landowners of a significant portion of the pipeline right-of-way and has access to on-site gravel resources, which no other contractor can bring to the table, none of them. As such, Diné LLC hereby requests ExxonMobil TransCanada to come to the table for meaningful discussions about how Diné LLC, representing the landowners, can participate in building the Alaska Pipeline Project. This position, by the way, has also been stated to APP multiple times over the last two years. In conclusion, 
This letter is a restatement of prior factual events, statements, and con conversations that have, been, that have transpired up to this point in time. This letter is also a formal statement of Danae LLC's continued willingness and ability to actively participate in building the Alaska Pipeline Project. So I would just like to offer these two documents into the record and uh, just say that we, we will have more specific uh, comments that we will file on the resource reports uh, by uh, February 27th. Okay, thank you, Mr. Breen. Next, uh, we have Cindy Roberts. Good evening, my name is Cindy Roberts. I'm here as a private citizen. I have no attachments to any organization or uh, um, a local group at all, but just questions and uh, uh, concerns regarding your process. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for, for doing this series of scoping sessions um, and having them spread across the state um, and giving the people that actually live here a chance to uh, interact both with your organization and with APP's process. Um, my concerns are that TransCanada uh, has yet to disclose the results of the open seasons that were held in Alaska, the Yukon, and British Columbia that were completed July 30th, 2010. And as of the AGEA uh, package on 4390-130, Section D, et cetera, et cetera, um, there was stipulation that the first binding open season would be concluded 36 months after granting of the AGEA license. That date, um, according to different things, was December 5 of last year. Although this has not been enforced by the state of Alaska, the EIS public scoping process is being carried forward by your agency. Um, so my question is more um, procedurally as to when the EIS process will be conducted for the other alternate route listed under AGEA. I know the, par the uh, paperwork that was started with you as an intent to file on August uh, 5th of 2011. I've concentrated only on the Alberta uh, route destination and uh, I would appreciate clarification as to when the AGEA discussion of an EIS for the other route will also be part of your process. Well, right now, the proposal is for the, for the Alberta option. So the EIS will, you know, that is considered to be the project being proposed by the applicant. So if at some point the applicant then decides that they will, you know, change the route or change their approach and they decide to, um, to go forward with an LNG option, then we would have to rescope. We would have to basically stop the process that we are on now and say, okay, if that is now your proposal, then we would have to open up a new scoping period and get new additional uh, resource reports to reflect that option. So, but right now, that's a hypothetical. What we have working, um, and what we have in front of us to work on is a proposal it's still in pre-filing, but let's say, assuming that the application um, later this year proposes the Alberta option, that will be what the EIS will focus on. Now, any EIS will look at alternate routes, but they will be looked at to the extent, um, you know, we have certain thresholds that we look at alternate routes, whether or not they, um, you know, the first and foremost is will it meet the project objective. So if the project objective is to send the gas through the Canadian, you know, through the Canadian system, then the alternative of going to Valdez will, will not meet that particular objective. So that would be, um, you know, not looked at as, as a, you know, a viable, robust alternative. But that's, right now, that's, 
you know, up, up to the applicant. What they file with us is what we will review as their proposed action. And right now it's looking like it's going to be the, uh, the Can Canadian option. Do you have information regarding the success of the open seasons in those three areas? I do not. That's, that's is the, the, you know, what my, my staff is working on and the staff that, that I represent is working on is the environmental analysis and the, the results of the open season is outside the scope of our environmental analysis. Um, there, there are times when, when projects come before us that at some later date, we, you know, it's determined that they're not viable, but until that date comes, we process our environmental analysis until the applicant either withdraws it or, um, you know, at, at some point the, the commission will either, you know, after the environmental analysis is done, if the applicant then moves forward with it, that's, that's up to them. So our job is to process um, the environmental analysis under NEPA based on the information that is on the file. And right now that is the um, Alberta option and I'm not um, privy to the results of the open season. So if I understand you correctly, at some point the governor may actually um, uh, encourage the AGA recipients and the APP group to explore the other option or? No, I, I have no idea what the governor may or may not do. That is, that is well outside of the scope <laughs> of what I do and what I know. So, um, you know, at the, I, you know the, I, I don't know what the, what the governor or the Alaska legislature will do um, with regards to the Valdez option. Mm -hmm. but right now, that is a hypothetical. What we have on the table in front of us is the Canadian option. So that's what we're working on. But like I said before, if, if something does happen, whether you know from the governor or from the um, applicant itself, you know, looking at the markets and changing their approach, if they do that and tell us that they're changing, then we will react to that. And if that involves new routing and new facilities, then we will have to, I mean, the schedule that we're on will, will of course be moot at that point and we will have mm -hmm. to rescope the new facilities and, you know, establish a new schedule based on that. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, sir. Glad you're here in Alaska. Okay. Okay, those, those are the only two people that signed up. However, this is your meeting, and if you've thought of something that you um, have a concern about uh, that's, you know, a, a potential environmental impact or, or something regarding the project, now's the time to, you know, you raise your hand and we'll, we'll have you come up and, and say that. If not, um, you know, you can write it down, like I said, or go home and do it, but um, I'm here for you. So now's your chance. Okay, I don't see any more takers. So what I'm gonna do is close the formal part of the meeting. Uh, like I said, I'm going to stay around. Um, representatives of the APP will stay around also if you want to uh, talk off the record or, or ask some additional questions. Anyone wish, um, wishing to purchase a copy of the transcripts can uh, make those arrangements with the court reporter. Within the FERC website, www.ferc.gov, that's FERC.gov, there's a link called eLibrary, and you can use eLibrary to gain access to all of the information that is on the public file, whether it's submitted by the applicant or issued uh, by the FERC. Uh, that was explained in the NOI, and there's also um, a handout at the, at the table as you came in that explains kind of how to, to, to use the FERC website to get that information. So on behalf of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and FEMSA, I wanna thank you all for coming here tonight. Let the record show that the Anchorage scoping meeting concluded at 8.14 p.m. Thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, actually just hand those though.